Okay, so as Ian mentioned, I'm going to kick us off and he already read my title, so I don't have to. But in this study, we were really interested in comparing the diagnostic consequences for both respiratory events and the resulting severity of diagnosis when we use different types of sleep tests that can be completed in the home. So what sleep tests are available right now? When typically when somebody has complaints about sleep and they meet with a medical professional, there are a few different types of tests that they may be referred for. The first is a type one, and this is the diagnostic gold standard. So this is the one where you go to the sleep lab, you're gonna have a sleep tech apply electrodes to your scalp, your face, as well as put respiratory bands on your chest and abdomen and put a cannula in your nose to record airflow as well as an oximeter on your finger to record oxygen saturation. And you're gonna be really closely monitored throughout the night. In a type two test, the patients have the same measurements taken, although they typically have fewer electrodes on the scalp. So for instance, the one we used in this study has just a forehead electrodes. But the difference is that they sleep within the comfort of their own home, so they don't have to go into the sleep lab. And some of these devices, such as Cerebras, are even able to be self-applied by the patient, so more convenient than the type 1s. But unfortunately, these devices are currently underutilized in clinical sleep medicine. And the last that I'm going to talk about is the type 3, and this is really frequently used in sleep medicine because you can test a lot of patients since it's done at home, and it also requires a lot less resources than the type one. However, the type three also does not measure EEG, so it does not activity, and it only really looks at different aspects of breathing. So this research and really looking into how a type two device can be used in clinical sleep medicine is especially salient right now with the COVID pandemic. So studies have shown that there are a greater proportion of studies that are home studies since there, we're seeing these greater reductions in lab testing as people are trying to reduce face-to-face -face contact. And so now that we have even more home testing, it's important to really be able to compare these different types of home tests that are available. And based on an, our industry analysis in Canada, approximately 80 to 90% of these sleep studies are actually these type three that aren't recording any EEG. And there are several reasons why we may expect to see differences in event counts and diagnosis between a type two and type three. So first, when we don't have that EEG component, we're not able to measure uh, what's called re-res or respiratory effort related arousals. And so we can't include those in the number of events because we can't detect the arousals without the EEG. And as well, the apnea hypopnea index is calculated typically by dividing the number of respiratory events by the total sleep duration. But when we don't have EEG, we don't know what the total sleep duration is. So we're forced to use the total recording time as the denominator, even though some of that recording is going to be time that's spent awake. So thus we're dividing by a larger value and we're gonna end up with fewer events per hour. So in this research project, we wanted to compare the event counts and diagnosis between a type two and a simulated type three in the same patients and actually within the same files to really understand what impact that loss of EEG is having on clinical use. So we downloaded 550 patient files from the Cerebra portal, complete with questionnaire data. I'm not gonna to talk too much about the questionnaire data, but it looks at different factors of sleep history as well as sleep complaints and sleepiness. And all of the sleep recordings were done with the Cerebra sleep system as type two recordings. And the files were then auto scored twice. So the first time they were scored as they were recorded as a type two, and then they were manually edit, edited by an RPS GT. The second scoring, they had the EEG information stripped. So they were left with only the nasal cannula, the chest belt, SpO2, body position, heart rate, and audio. So that simulates a type three study. So what did we find? We, as we expected, found that compared to the type two RDI, which just means that it includes the RERAs, uh, the type three event count had a lower number of events per hour. So we had about an average of 21.1 in the type twos and only 16.6 in the type threes. 
And our next question was what impact these differences in the event counts are having clinically. So this table is looking at the impact of the type two shown across the top with the type three shown down the side and the severity of diagnosis that each patient would receive based on their test at that, uh, that type of test. So across the diagonal here, these are the diagnoses that the two tests agreed on, and that accounted for about 68% of the patients had the same diagnosis with a type two and type three. But of particular interest are these 78 in this blue box, because these are the patients who would receive a diagnosis of moderate sleep apnea with a type two, but only mild with a type three. And that's important because for these patients, the use of the type two might enable them to be eligible for treatment with CPAP while the type three would not, since typically it's moderate and severe patients that are treated. And so that accounted for about 15% of our sample that would go untreated despite having moderate sleep apnea if we only looked at those type three test results, which again is a very common test in Canada and other places around the world. So this figure is just another way to show that, and it's showing the number of patients meeting the criteria for diagnosis at each severity level of sleep apnea. So as you can see with the simulated type three in teal, you can see there's more patients meeting the uh, criteria for no OSA and mild OSA. But when we cross this line into the group that typically receives treatment, we see that we are picking up more patients in the moderate and severe categories. And that actually coincided with a 41% increase in the number of treatable patients when we used a type two compared to a type three test. So what are our next steps? Well, type three devices also are focused really on the diagnosis of sleep disordered breathing, and they can miss the diagnosis of other sleep disorders such as periodic limb movement disorder, so for example, in our sample, we had 16 individuals or 3% of our sample who had more than 20 PLMs per hour with the type two that would have gone completely unrecognized with the type three. So we'd like to further investigate that in our sample, just those presence of other sleep disorders. Our next step is to look, really look deep into that questionnaire data to look at factors that may be especially key in picking out who may benefit more from a type two and who we should prioritize that type two for. So what factors are predicting those larger discrepancies in event counts or those differences in diagnosis between the two tests. And there has been some research done on this in the past. So previous research, has looked at what factors may be especially important when we look at the variation between using total recording time and total sleep time. And as expected, factors that are associated with greater wait time, such as age and low sleep efficiency, have these larger discrepancies. So in this case, these types of patients and these types of factors may be especially important for us to consider when determining if a type two or a type three study is more appropriate for an individual patient. So one of the variables that we're really interested in focusing on is insomnia-like symptomology. So based on the greater awake time that we may see with insomnia, they could have greater expectancy or discrepancies. And we may expect then that these individuals who have complaints of insomnia would be more benefited by using a level two. And we're also really interested into looking into patients who are at greater risk of being underdiagnosed. So those who maybe are at low risk of sleep apnea that would be missed if they just had the type three. So overall, we found that type three did underdiagnose obstructive sleep apnea, and that when those changes in event counts occurred around a diagnostic cutoff, it can have an impact on the severity of diagnosis and ultimately what treatment or if they get treatment. So when we incorporate EEG into home testing, we find that there are a greater number of patients identified that are eligible and in need of treatment. And the use of the type two device also still keeps some of those convenience benefits of the type three as it's done at home. And really when we think about it, inclusion of EEG into our sleep testing is really important for when we're measuring sleep disorder since EEG is really the way to actually record sleep. So increasing, the use of type twos can help put the sleep back into our sleep medicine. And that's it for me.